Hello, my name is Kevin Duffy. I'm the Managing Director of Cyber Rescue Alliance. We are a firm that helps people like you who have kindly given up your time to think about uh, the risk of a breach at your own organization or at a supplier and crucially uh, what you can do to mitigate any harms from that. So I'm delighted, as you can see, to be joined by an expert panel who will be introducing themselves very shortly. Uh, but just to confirm the uh, session that you have joined, it will last about 50 minutes and we'll be exploring lessons learned from uh, the expert panel we, we have for you on breaches that happened in 2021 and that we're all anticipating will happen in 2022. Uh, we are recording uh, this session and we'll be um, making a, a video recording available shortly afterwards. And we very much hope that all of you who are investing your time to, to listen in will follow up um, uh, immediately afterwards. Um, so, um, Without further ado, let's uh, start jumping into uh, introductions. Um, Matthew, if I could ask you just to explain your background and role very quickly for everyone. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew McKenna. I'm president of international sales at Security Scorecard. Um, been at Security Scorecard since 2018, growing the international business. We had started out as three people at that time. We're now a team of 51, expected to grow to 85 this year. And in that time, we have grown our business to support over 550 customers across 62 different countries in the international business. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Cyber Rescue uh, to permit us to co-sponsor this event, as well, of course, our panelists and our customers who are tremendously invaluable partners along this journey of how we can help our customers and along this uh, cyber risk journey that they're they're facing on a daily basis. So thank you to all our panelists. Great, thanks Matthew. Aaron? Hi, good morning all. My name is Aaron Balodi. Uh, I work as an information security manager for Apex Global. Uh, in the payment industry for last 12 and a half years, approximately dealing with various PCI DSS and ISO compliances and overall IT experience of 17 years. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Aaron. And what about you, Chris? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris McElwain. Uh, I am currently the Cyber Threat Intelligence Lead for Sainsbury's Bank and Argos Financial Services. Um, I joined the organization in December 2020, so just uh, over a year. Uh, now in setting up the, the function and uh, making it operational. Uh, prior to that, I had 10 years experience in various uh, information security and cyber threat uh, roles at Morgan Stanley, uh, working out of Glasgow. Um, and that follows uh, 10 years uh, of roles within the IT uh, service industry. So good range of experience, despite the fact I clearly don't look old enough for that, for that much. <laughs> We, we will be promoting a range of skincare products uh, at the end of this <laughs> webinar. Uh, <laughs> talking of other uh, good looking and wonderful panelists, we have alphabetically Deborah. I need to call on you to introduce yourself next. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, not sure how I can follow that, Chris. Uh, so I'm Deborah Howarth. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Penguin Random House in the UK. I've been with PRH or Penguin since uh, 2018. Prior to that, I had about 14 years experience in Fujitsu, one of the leading managed IT service providers. I have a checkered history going back with various industries in various roles. Prior to that, I've um, been working in information security for around about 26 years now in one form or another. Um, my areas of specialism really are governance, risk and compliance and crisis management. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Ne never a dull day in your job, I'm sure. Uh, George, tell us about yourself. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is George Blandin. I lead the CISO for Party Assurance for Fintesco Bank. I'm um, similar to Chris. Um, my career has been spanned across most of the UK banks, um, specialising in operational risk and then moving into information security in the last 15 or so years. Um, and we're looking after a broad range of suppliers um, with an outsourced model. 
um, from our fintech companies right way up to our blue chip organisational companies as well. And uh, we've been actively using Scorecard for just shy of three years now. Thanks, George, and using it very well, if I may say so. But we're going to come to that. Uh, Kevin, uh, you've been using Security Scorecard for a while as well, but what, tell us about yourself. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. My, my, my name is, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin O'Rourke. Um, until recently, I was the, the Chief Risk Officer at Mizuho Bank, um, uh, responsible for the EMEA region, one of the, the large Japanese banks. I sp spent 21 years at Mizuho, nine years at the Industrial Bank of Japan, 30 odd years in total. People get sentences less than that for uh, for misdemeanors, but uh, a thoroughly enjoyable time. Uh, they're involved with all lines of defense, first, second, third line. As Kevin said, uh, we introduced cyber rescue and security scorecard into Mizuho a few years back. Uh, and now I'm actually acting as, a, as an independent advisor to uh, Cyber Rescue Lines. Glad to be on the call, looking forward to the conversation. Okay. And, and Kevin, it's amazing you look even younger than Chris, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in the green room afterwards. Um, let's, let's get on to the, the substance of the discussion because um, we know most of the people who've given their time to listen into this session or recently started using security scorecard or are thinking of, of doing so in the next few weeks. And, and maybe if we put ourselves um, back in, in their shoes, thinking about um, why companies would have uh, made such a substantial investment, um, you know, how they're going to be justifying uh, that investment, um, making sure they get an, an ROI. You've got to be clear about what are the, the specific business risks, technical issues, management problems that um, investing in a cyber, rescue, a cyber risk management tool like Security Scorecard can help you solve? In other words, what were you trying to achieve um, when you started using the service? And perhaps, Aaron, if I could start with you on that. Aaron, Absolutely. would you like to go first? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. So in terms of our you know, security scorecard experience as well, in terms of what problems we have resolved using the platform, it is amazing from where we started the journey and where we are at the moment in a gap of like seven months. Uh, the main reasons for us onboarding a platform like Security Scorecard is to match up with our various compliance, which we, uh, you know, as, a, as in the payment industry dealing with the live transaction. So we use Security Scorecard to gain those compliances like ISO 27001, PCI DSS. And also now the key part is it's helping us out in building up our roadmap for SOC 2 type two types of compliances as well. Third party risk is a very, uh, you know, I will say it's one of the most crucial aspect of any of these compliances. And as far as risk postures is concerned for a given organization, it's very important to be on top of it and platform like security scorecard and with that additional help from Cyber Rescue, right? The reports we get out from uh, Cyber Rescue is, is just fantastic. And the other key bit here is it's about not about learning and improving the cyber uh, posture for third parties, also learning from what is actually happening globally and implementing you know the gaps and making sure the gaps are remediated within your business as well so it's 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 a two way handshake that's the way i see this in terms of you know using the platform improving your third party security posture eventually it will improve yours as well and also you know what is happening at the at the global level learn from their mistakes from others mistakes and make sure that you don't repeat the same mistakes in a, in your own platform so that's the biggest yeah, advantage thanks, Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of the detail in that, uh, I'm sure, but that point about learning from each other is, is, is a very strong one. But Chris, do you want to jump in? What thinking back, what, what problems, what issues, what were your objectives? Certainly, yeah. So one of the first challenges that I encountered when I joined Sainsbury's Bank was the uh, overarching dependency on uh, third party suppliers that we have here within the bank. We're a very, very outsourced organization. And when uh, within my role where I always have to apply a threat uh, assessment perspective to the work that I do. It's very, very important that I understand the risks, not only to our internal organization, but also those which come through the supply chain and come through those managed service providers that we utilize. Um, it was very 
apparent to me that a number of our important business services, something Kevin referenced earlier, uh, were uh, actually outsourced to various suppliers. So the organisation already had a fair idea about its operational priorities and what it considered critical in terms of business functions which were managed by those suppliers. What it didn't have was a view on the threats that those suppliers may face, um, so understanding what threat actors might target in terms of looking at our supply chain, but also the level of security maturity and security controls that those suppliers may have. Um, obviously, the suppliers are not restricted to one sector, they're not restricted to one particular function. Some will have more consideration on security than others, that's just natural when we look at that such a wide supplier base. So having a tool like Security Scorecard and having ability uh, to have that cohesive and comprehensive view of our supplier portfolio is very, very important. And actually to reference something Aaron said, it's a two-way street. It's about communication and engagement. Security scorecard is not a tool for being big brother and watching what suppliers are doing and how well they're doing it. It's an opportunity to engage with those suppliers, to uh, relay what works well within our organization that they can lean on and vice versa, what we can draw from their experience. It also gives us an opportunity to have that comprehensive assurance that our key assets, our key operations are safe, they're being protected uh, according to the standard that we expect from our suppliers. Um, and it allows us to address any concerns in a very direct and collaborative manner. And I think collaboration is one of the biggest uh, advantages of using a uh, security scorecard. So um, I'll, I'll probably leave it there for the moment. I know we're going to go into a bit more detail. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's great, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, well, a, let, let, a, let's make, let, let, exactly. I think your point about engaging and collaborating, let's keep the conversation flowing. Uh, George, just thinking about uh, objectives, what you, oh, sorry, De Deborah first, of course, and then I'll come to George. Uh, Deborah, in terms of uh, objectives that you're trying to, to fill? Uh, yes, yeah, so we actually started using Security Scorecard to improve our own security posture, first of all. So unlike many of my, um, my peers here on this panel, I'm not in a regulated industry, Penguin Re Random House is, uh, entirely a commercial venture without regulation. So we're not compliance driven. Um, however, we are aware of risk. So we're coming from a risk position and we wanted to reduce the uh, risk of a data breach, particularly within our organization uh, in common with many other media organizations we're t highly targeted. We have some very valuable intellectual property and we talk about and publish some very interesting and contentious topics, uh, which sometimes makes us a target for nefarious activity. So we wanted to reduce that risk somewhat, um, but we soon became aware, as anybody would, that we're actually intertwined with our supply chain and with our partnerships. and in order to reduce our own risk, it's really helpful if we can reduce the risk across the publishing ecosystem. So we've started a journey, we use Security Scorecard to um, really facilitate a series of conversations directly with our most critical suppliers. And some of our most critical suppliers uh, are really working with legacy um, technology or operational technology. Um, some of them are working with IoT. Um, so we're not a traditional, you know, run a big data center or run a whole host of things in the cloud type of organization because we produce a product rather than a service. So we've got a, uh, you know, we've got warehouse distribution center, we've got conveyor belts, we've got packaging that goes on and all of those suppliers bring a unique set of risks and um, perspective to that landscape and uh, Security Scorecard has been one of the tools we've used to engage in conversation. It is a fascinating landscape you're defending, Deborah. Uh, but George, your perspective? Yeah, um, I think it was more of an operational demand. Um, we had to balance an increasing demand pipeline against limited resource and it was coming apparent very quickly that the, the overhead to support that in a timely manner and an effective manner was, was becoming too much of a stretch. Um, so security scorecards came in as we've had the ability to look across and we can take a kind of pragmatic and prioritised approach relative to the materiality of the supplier. 
So we can look at the, the low value, high volume suppliers and we can leverage heavily on the scorecard, allowing the limited resource for my team to focus on the more material suppliers as well. Um, the other benefit from that is that we can move to market a lot quicker on new to bank. Um, where we've got potentially three or four suppliers that are vying for the same um, proposition or contract. We can very quickly have a little look across as to those four potential vendors and we can start to form a summary view or dashboard of security posture and that allows my team very quickly to apply the resource relative to the kind of short list, if we can use that term, of potential um, suppliers. So um, driven out of operational necessity and uh, we've unlocked the value that's uh, been within thereafter. I, I love the way, George, you use the service to help your organization accelerate. You know, it's a complete opposite from the, the traditional, oh, cybersecurity is a break. Um, but we must move on quickly. Kevin, uh, thinking yeah. about your time at Mizuho. Sure, Kevin. And, and what I don't want to do is, is reiterate many of the, the good points. that, that uh, uh, One of the things about going last is that all the points have been made by the time it gets to you. But maybe just look from a... From a chief risk officer perspective, I had a second line, uh, and certainly within the banking industry sector, many sectors are like this because of the sensitive nature of the business we're in with, with uh, customer data. Um, when, when I first became responsible for this, I was looking at the ring fence areas that we had and, and the first line IT, and that was all particularly well looked after. Uh, the next area was, I suppose, training and awareness of how you protect staff and keep them. Um, cyber hygiene alert, so training and awareness, phishing tests, all that sort of thing. Again, all pretty good. So, so the one area that I looked at that I, it became as a surprise to me uh, when I started looking at this was that third-party vendors, fourth-party vendors are potentially the Trojan horse. You can have the best ring-fenced IT perimeters around, but you're linked to a third-party vendor whose cyber hygiene score is really low, and you're blind mm -hmm. to it. So to me, uh, looking for something, and, and what I suppose many organizations have is this um, it's questionnaire they send out. Are you ISO compliant? Do you comply with all this? You may get a piece of paper back. You may not. Even if you do, you've got a one-stop shop time piece of paper. Security scorecard, for me, gave me the ability what, to demonstrate that we were taking cybersecurity seriously. Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, as a chief risk officer, as executives on the board, uh, they, they want, the question is, so what? What are you doing about it? How do you demonstrate you're doing something uh, to, to mm -hmm. mitigate risk? And Scorecard gives you that independent uh, view and uh, ability to have a dialogue with vendors that you can demonstrate uh, you know, uh, concrete action as to how you're maintaining governance over cyber rescue. Kevin, if I could jump in there, about that, that point about dialogue, uh, similar to what Chris was talking about, engagement. Um, if, you, if you want to manage a risk while accelerating your business and demonstrating compliance, there's normally a variety of stakeholders who are involved. And, and we all know that you know, no matter how amazing a, a platform or a tool is, you've, you've got to work with people to, to get the, the return on investment. So let's think about the stakeholders, the, the bosses, the colleagues, the suppliers, contractors, who uh, you need, Chris, as you were saying, to, to engage with, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate uh, compliance, Kevin, and to show Deborah that you're managing the risk, and think about who should be involved, um, and, and crucially, how best to organize that engagement um, to to really leverage to, to maximise the return on investment when you're getting these cyber risk uh, measurements. You know the, the who and the how to herd the cats, as the cliche goes. Alan, would you like to go first again? Absolutely. Uh, so the practices which we follow using the security scorecard and cyber rescue assistance, you know, various reports and platform within Apex is we generate a monthly report for all the business heads, uh, sales, finance, they should have the full visibility of, you know, how our internal posture is looking and how our external third party risk posture is looking, right? Because they interact with the clients, they interact with, you know, future prospects, so they should have the proper visibility. 
and also then we create a weekly pack for our executive board uh, where i mentioned it earlier as well you know where 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 are our you can say financial risks associated with third parties or our reputational risk associated with third party and we do have our internal matrix and you know in terms of how we are defining those risk patterns and on top of that we get into a roadmap cycle here you know defining the risk what are we actually doing to mitigate the risk the good thing again for uh, using the platform here is that you just don't get the risk you do get the resolutions as well as part of your you know overall offering so when we present it to the you know board or to all the heads it's not only about these are my risk you provide a roadmap for the resolutions as well so from our perspective what we follow internally is absolute transparency where do we stand as a business where do our third party stand as a business that's fabulous thank you Aaron. and of course you know that that comment you started with about sharing with your sales people um, you know, and potentially your, your own customers. Um, I would say in my experience, it's only about 10% of, of firms who uh, use the tool proactively with that level of proactive transparency. Matthew, I'll come to you later about how the, you're seeing that the tool evolve um, and, and different ways uh, it can be used. But in terms of herding the cats, Chris, who, who should be aware um, and are responsible and all, all the other acronym letters who, who to engage with a tool like that no nobody kevin i'm, I'm an intel guy i share nothing uh keep it keep it all in there. No, not, not, not at all. fantastic let's all right so moving on um <laughs> oh was there something no, you wanted no, to add chris no. There was, yeah. I mean, in all seriousness, one thing I do want to, to mention about security scorecard and use it. So security scorecard is not the overall solution to your supplier management uh, process. It's there to augment. It's there to actually enhance what you should have or are looking to, to implement in place. So we have a number of different uh, supplier management functions. And one of the great advantages of incorporating uh, security scorecard and, and, you know, via the, the service that Cyber Rescue offer is the fact that we can bring those uh, each of those separate functions functions and processes together. We have that reporting view, which I think Arun's very rightly uh, mentioned there. So we have the ability to report on our uh, supplier portfolio. And that's never a static report. It's something that should evolve over time. And again, we talk about the roadmap, we talk about the journey. Um, anything that we identify uh, within our supplier base, whether it be a risk, a threat, something of concern, something we want to address, we get to see that from the point it's identified through that engagement model, that piece of collaboration with the suppliers, get our stakeholders involved. So each of their objectives are all obviously incorporated into that. And then we get to see the journey through to the resolution, whether that's working with the supplier to uh, reconcile some of those concerns or address some of those concerns um, and maybe uh, resolve some of the findings that we have. And therefore we're continually giving our, our board members and our stakeholders that view on the position of our supplier portfolio at any given time. And that's quite important for really uh, emphasizing that, that we have a handle um, on a supplier base. We recognize the risks. We recognize the threats and we know at any given time that we can take either a proactive action um, on any of the findings that are highlighted by uh, security scorecard so that independent view is very very useful but it is very stakeholder focused and it's not just about supporting that one process it's about bringing the supplier process together and augmenting them with this very effective service fabulous thank you chris what about you deborah Yes, yeah, so, well, we use the uh, security scorecard as a tool, um, very much as, as Chris said, as part of an overall third party supplier risk management um, approach. Uh, strategically, um, we would look at a visualization of supplier risk on a quarterly basis at our security board meeting. Uh, key leaders there, key board members there, CFO, for example, interested in where we're spending our money, is this bringing a a risk to us in terms of financial loss. Um, we might have our, our legal director there. Um, what does this mean in terms of upcoming contract renegotiations we might have? Um, we'll have our, our data protection officer will be interested in terms of which of these suppliers are processing personal data, sensitive personal data. Our HR team will be interested because they obviously uh, historically have developed and bought their own systems outside of any interaction with their technology colleagues. So they're managing their own suppliers. Similarly, our distribution team are managing their own suppliers. So 
uh, our MD of distribution is represented there. So, oh, and our CIO as well, one of my, my other peers is there um, because obviously technology are interested. Key stakeholder for me in terms of process, so not at the strategic monitoring view, would be our head of procurement. Um, working hand in hand in procurement is part of the due diligence process for onboarding suppliers. Nobody wants to onboard somebody that's got a bag of bricks that they're carrying around on their shoulders. You want to you want to onboard somebody that's not going to bring you that burden of risk. Um, so our um, procurement team very key day-to-day -day operational engagement there. Operational engagement with our brand team because the risk that we're protecting against is a risk to our very considerable brand. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots and lots of areas really where we're looking at this and then of course tactically we might have to intervene if a supplier has a breach, we might want to start looking at their posture. And oftentimes it's only when a small niche supplier has a breach that you actually find out they are in the supply chain. Um, yes, well, we'll, we'll come to that, Deborah. You've, that fact, we're, we're, let's make time to drill in in a moment to how to engage with suppliers, but um, you know, from, from sales, from Arun and uh, supply chain from Chris, onto CFOs and managing directors and privacy. George, uh, who are the stakeholders that you try to bring together? Yeah, so I echo the, the previous comments from the other panelists. I, I think we, we're trying to take a stepped approach to unlock the value relative to the audience. So anyone who's involved in the risk cycle for supplier management, we will lobby. So, and that starts, you know, from the top of the food chain right the way down to the, the kind of you know, the different roles that are involved. Um, so the supplier managers are absolutely key. They're the ones who have the interlock with the, the, the uh, suppliers on a daily basis, a weekly basis, not just at the point of renewal or when something sadly goes wrong. Um, we take a kind of proactive approach and go threat hunting with them. Um, so if we're aware of a degradation of service, we will notify not just at the point of review or when the cycle of assessments uh, been based. And that's been pivotal because it helps us increase the visibility and profile of cybersecurity across multiple layers. And it also keeps it as a kind of a, a standing agenda point. So we d we've developed that into conversations with performance with the suppliers. Um, so they're aware, not just at a point of review when my team go in and do it, they know that there's a cycle of assessment that's coming up and the hygiene factors that that's an organisation they should have in place, um, which can be observed. And again, as I think it was mentioned previously, that creates fantastic conversations about collaboration and support. And mm -hmm. it doesn't become yeah. a cyclic activity, it becomes part of their housekeeping, um, which is in everyone's interest as we start to move forward. That, that's what you absolutely want. Um, Kevin, um, having been using Scorecard at one of, I think, the 10 biggest banks in the world, um, are there any other stakeholders, just to finish that off? Um, regulators, uh, insurers, uh, international uh, colleagues? Uh, maybe. Just to, you know, this was a product I wanted to bring in. And so my initial, th I think you need to involve all the stakeholders and get their buy-in to begin with. So a good way of actually getting the top of the house, the executive, is a simulation of a data breach through maybe a third-party vendor. Focuses the mind, you know, sets the light bulb going. I think you definitely need your first-line IT people on board because the initial challenge is, oh, well, we, we do this already. Why are you questioning what we're doing? And, and that conversation is more or less, we're not questioning what we're doing. We're trying to support what you're doing and better understand it. We're second line. I can tell you about market credit, liquidity, all that stuff. I don't know about cadence, patching, all the rest of it. So we can learn from you. Uh, and at the same time, we're trying to you know, provide that oversight and support to you. And once that relationship is struck in, in the right way, it becomes a very collaborative, very fruitful. I now know things about cybersecurity and IT I've never knew uh, before. And because it became a sort of a mutually collaborative benefit uh, once it's explained properly. This is not a threat to you. This is enhancing what you're doing and potentially providing more resource uh, because, the, 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 I'm sorry, just to, to follow up on that, the, the people that own the third party vendors, the relationship managers with those vendors as well, you need to speak to them because they've created a relationship and this isn't a threat to them. It's potentially a benefit. Um, so there's a lot of, of, of negotiation to be done. I was fortunate that I really uh, 
thought it was a good product. And I agree with Chris, it's, it's one tool in the basket to, to mitigate against cyber rescue. But then the beauty of it is the reporting end, getting it all back in the loop. So everybody can see, you know, we said this was what it could do, and look at the reports that we're getting out from it. What do you want to see? The trend, this is what went wrong, this is what we've done to mitigate that. So it's it's the, the end product is the action that's taken from all of that. It's not just compliance. It's actually a really good marketing to your customers. Well, Kevin, I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to have to interrupt you because you use the phrase end product, and in a moment, ah. Matthew, I'll I'll come to you about um, uh, some of the ways you're seeing customers around the world uh, using the service and, and things uh, to evolve. Um, <laughs> uh, Kevin mentioned, um, and it made me smile though about. Um, uh, doing a, a simulation, I think for almost everybody on this call, yes, we we have done a cyber attack simulation for uh, with many of you with some of your suppliers, and that that is a very um, visceral, um, uh, emotional way of <laughs> understanding the importance of suppliers having a a good cyber security posture. Uh, yes, that that helps reach the the heart. But on, on the, the minds and the analysis, Matthew, you're, you're seeing demand for new capability um, to, to help with this in, engagement that the panel have been discussing. What, what are your thoughts? What are you seeing elsewhere? You know, this, is, this has been great to be a fly on the wall over the last 30 minutes listening to the, the insights of our customers here. Um, and some of the common themes that I've picked as this discussion has been going on is one is around the needs for around board reporting and how you're demonstrating that you've been able to mitigate the risk. So we've been having a lot of discussions with our customers in this area. And one of the capabilities that we're introducing now is something called attack surface intelligence. Right now, the security ratings tool highlights what's open, what's out there, what are the vulnerabilities that exist. What the attack surface intelligence capability is going to provide our customers is that capability to see are there threat actors out there which are actively exploiting those vulnerabilities related to a scorecard? And are there threat actors that are exploiting specifically that vulnerability that's sitting on a scorecard? So it's taking it now down to the next level to even provide further context of what should we really be focusing on with our, our vendors and our supply chain. So that's that's a really exciting capability. There's a, probably about 120 test customers around the globe right now already working with that, and we expect to launch that probably by the end of this quarter into a GA version for our customers. So that's a really exciting um, capability. The second area which we see, again, in terms of reporting is a lot of our customers want to get the insights as to, well, okay, this is what our third party looks like. What does it look like down further in the supply chain? So a new capability which we just released, uh, I think it's a day ago, two days ago, is called automated vendor detection. And what automated vendor detection is doing is it's allowing us to gain insight into those connections that are occurring from our organization, not only to the third party, but now extending that out into the fourth parties and being able to easily grab that information into portfolios, get an assessment of what that risk looks like. Um, so this is a really nice, let's say, linkage into further and deeper insights um, around that. Another area which, um, again, going into the reporting side and how this all links back to reporting upwards, another capability we're introducing is dollar risk modeling. Um, so I think, Arun, you brought this up at the beginning, saying I need to demonstrate to my board, well, what is the impact if one of my vendors get breached, right? Um, so this will allow you to link that cyber risk mitigation discussion together. What is that dollar impact that we're potentially going to see um, along the way? Um, and then bringing this all back to uh, a topic of compliance, I think one of the kind of the most interesting things when I've seen with customer discussions is you talk about audits and I've never seen CISOs with uh, a smile on the face. The worst time you can call a CISO is when they're going through an audit. I've never seen them more edgy. So I always advise my entire sales team, avoid audit week. Um, when it comes to the audit side, We've introduced capabilities to help our customers reduce the amount of time they're working on getting information from their vendors. So Evidence Locker is one of those big pieces that we've introduced, which allows you in that invited vendor process, when you invite the vendor in, have them upload, whether it's their SOC 2 reports, their PCI reports, whatnot. 
I've gotten feedback from many customers that 80% of that vendor engagement time is spent collecting artifacts. And we're seeing more and more move of how do I how do I kind of get away from questionnaires and that kind of manual process? And how do I automate more and more of this when it comes to that interaction with the vendor, how I collect that evidence and then engage with them on those cyber risks? So that's a quick summary of kind of the takeaways I've taken over the last 30 minutes. Happy to provide more as we go along. Well, but no, no, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. I think let, let's build on the, um, you know, you talk about the 80% of time um, you know, that firms who are listening in, thinking about their own cybersecurity, managing their suppliers. Um, it, it's also a, a huge burden on the suppliers um, themselves. And, and, and they know that, you know, <laughs> uh, typically suppliers, don't smile when they get a, a call from the the CISO of of one of their their customers. Like, oh, this is going to be painful. Um, so maybe if we move on to again the the practicalities that are the people who are listening in just started using Security Scorecard or um, about to do so, the practicalities of maximising the return on investment. You know that that requires effective engagement. Um, with, with those suppliers um, around their cybersecurity posture. So let's just do a, a quick run, and, and maybe this time I'll challenge you to think of a specific anecdote or a specific process that you think is you know, reusable, a learning moment uh, for, for our delegates. Aaron? Uh, example I'll give you, which we have faced while we started this journey with security scorecard. So when you're going with going to your suppliers, asking them, you know, fill these 500 questions, 200 questions, there is always a friction in terms of why you are doing this. You know, with the with the stats we are now getting from the suppliers and the, the improvement we have done in our entire supply chain process and due diligence is like we are getting less and less friction. Now, what improvement I'm talking about. So now when we are going to a vendor or a supplier stating we need to go through this supplier due diligence process, we are going with some stats as well, saying if it's a critical risk uh, supplier for us, then we say, you know, you need to be on category A. And why then we give them evidence is why do we want you to be on category A? For example, like if you stay on category B or below category, you know, or category C, you will say that scope and the chances of you getting breached, you know, uh, are very high. So hence, you know, that's one of the reasons. So that's what we have learned from, I will say, uh, from our experience that previously we were just going out directly to the vendors saying, let's start the process. But now we have tweaked it. We are going to the vendors with the proper stats that why we are doing it and what's the benefit to them doing this overall exercise. Fantastic. Great. Let's move on, Chris. Yeah, I think I think a couple of things have already been touched on um, by both Kevin and Aaron actually, and I, I think you know one one example I can draw on is the the recent Log Four G uh, vulnerability, uh, which as we know is not a breach in itself, but is certainly from a threat standpoint, was something that was of con uh, considerable concern. You know, this was a CVSS vulnerability score of ten, which is the highest uh, category of vulnerability and one of the first ones we'd seen in a while. Now, uh, obviously, there's a lot of internal work we do uh, to make sure we're not vulnerable to that uh, to that threat. But one of the advantages we have by utilizing a, a tool such as Supplier Scorecard is we're able to check the, for example, the patching cadence of some of our key and critical suppliers. Um, that allows us to prioritize to an extent our supplier engagement to check the assurance that our crit critical assets uh, and the, uh, even things like data, sensitive data that those suppliers may be custodian of uh, are likely to be, uh, to be safe. Now, that doesn't mean that again, we're going out and saying your patching cadence is a C or a D. You know, you must fix this because we have this critical vulnerability that, that must be must be patched, otherwise it may lead to a, to an exposure. But what it allows us to do is facilitate those discussions. It gives us, and, and one of the tenets of intelligence, uh, actually, intelligence provision, is being able to inform decisions. It's being able to inform decision making, making sure we've got evidence, we've got fact-based decisions to be made, uh, and this is why this uh, particular tool is so important. You know, we were able to go out to, to prioritise a list of suppliers, go out and actually facilitate those discussions with some evidence and some facts behind us, uh, some independent facts, along with the, the, the work we've done uh, internally. Um, and that made those discussions much more targeted, much more concise, much more to the point. They were far less speculative, far less investigatory, and actually much more collaborative. And I think that's very, very important. So yeah, the, the, the 
speed uh, and expeditions we were able to to reach those uh, critical suppliers um, was very much facilitated by the the information at hand through suppliers uh, scorecard. Security scorecard. Yeah, sorry. That's a very good spe specific example. Um, De Deborah, more, more broadly, um, how do you engage with suppliers? Well, uh, I was really fascinated to hear from Matthew about the evidence locker because um, when we talk about due diligence, um, you know, as Aaron said, you want to do that on a risk basis. So you don't want to put everybody through 500 questions. I mean, who's actually got the time to read 500 answers times three? Um, you just really haven't got the resources to absorb and analyze that. So the evidence locker is, is a great idea because at the moment we do reuse industry standard certifications, registrations, reports that an organization might have. So if they're a cloud vendor, for example, we might ask them for their CAIQ questionnaire and then they feel that they're just collaborating with us, providing us with something that they already have and they appreciate we've taken 80 questions out of the arsenal. Um, and if they're a high risk vendor, depending on what sort of data they process, whether they have privileged access to our systems, whether they're connected directly to our systems, that all influences the risk profile as well as the amount we spend, the business processes they support. Um, and then we can focus our attention on the things that matter. And that's really important. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about engaging with those suppliers that support your critical business processes, those suppliers that are critical to the ongoing survival of, of us as a business or to the protection of our brand. And we've had some a great results from that engagement. So, you know, we talk about some uh, legacy type technologies that some of our suppliers might use. Um, there's, there's also a sense sometimes in this kind of production environment that we've always done it this way. So, you know, it's not broke. Mm -hmm. Why bother fixing it? Well, the point is, of course, you, you don't know that it's not broken um, until you start having a look and investigating. And then you might find things that are surprising. And, and we've definitely seen the security posture of some of our key suppliers improve once we've started engaging with them. And not only have they improved, but they've maintained that improvement and they've been able to take those discussions back in-house and just take the next step on their own maturity journey. And that's been really important for us. Yeah, yeah that, that's fundamentally about what it's about, isn't it? On that journey, improving the maturity, working as a team. And, and yeah, what, what I've seen you do, Penguin, uh, Penguin Deborah, supporting um, your suppliers is, is phenomenal. Uh, Kevin, just rounding out, um, is, is there anything you'd like to add on engaging with suppliers or thinking about them? I, I just think Deborah made a couple of really, really good points there and the dialogue with the suppliers. My, my previous answer was talking about mainly, mainly internal stakeholders, but that dialogue and the initial contact with the customer can sometimes be a tricky one. And so that initial contact is, is, is key. And also the initial setup when you set the IP addresses and what part of an organization you're, you're targeting. Um, they're, 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 the, they're the key bits. But just as Deborah was saying, as that dialogue improves, certainly where I previously worked, um, the, the vendors were really engaged with it. And to some extent, were even calling us to find out what their security posture was. So that's how far it, it, the journey had progressed, that it became, you know, the cyber criminals are out there and they've got uh, resources that they're exposing and they only got to hit one to be successful. If yeah. as an industry, mm -hmm. collaborate and work together to fight against that threat, then it's a mutually beneficial uh, thing. So th th there are just a couple yes. of the added points I, I, I put, uh, Kevin. Well, and, and the thing is, no. we, we action is we have changed suppliers we did change vendors yeah you know this is a practical tool if you are talking to a vendor and you're telling them what's gone wrong and you've got the evidence as chris was saying the good thing is you have the evidence here this is we can show you what we're seeing and what an attacker can see they're not listening to that a decision has to be made uh, as to whether or not you you persist with that and you've got the evidence to show that if somebody's trending downwards in a security scarred posture inevitably they will be breached that's evidence-based as well so 
Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very useful tool. And for anybody uh, thinking about uh, onboarding, uh, just, just, there are just a couple of thoughts for them. Thank you. Kevin, you inspired me there to take a risk on technology. I don't know if you or Deborah, am I now sharing a screen? I wasn't really planning to. Yeah? Yes, So, so just, thank you. I, just for, for those who can see it, therefore, um, when um, many of the panelists have referred to the monthly reports uh, that they get, one of the ways that, that some of you I know find very helpful that links to your point, Kevin, about you know, let, let's change a supplier that has a low score. What you're seeing here is eight um, breaches that the scorecard platform has anticipated in the last few days. So um, the Central Bank of Indonesia, for example, compared with other central banks or um, uh, uh, the, the biggest insurer in Lebanon compared to other leading insurers. Crypto firms, um, if I go on to the next page, if I can do that. Um, technology, companies, retail, health. Um, the blue line is imagine a supplier compared to their peers. If they are um, consistently below um, an alternative uh, supplier, if you're, I don't know, um, investing in retailers around the world. Um, Aditya Birla is one of the biggest in India, and they just compared with other big brands like Jack Will, Wills and River Island and Primark and Next along here. And the blue line is showing um, uh, how the breach was anticipated you know, months before the Red Star, the breach uh, actually happened. But that's the kind of thing that um, we can um, uh, share in the, the follow-up with those uh, who are interested. We've obviously been recording uh, this, this conversation and um, we'll be uh, sharing that with, with all of you who've given up your time uh, to participate. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, like me, you found uh, the conversation really interesting. And if the panelists would like to stay on for a couple of minutes um, after we close, uh, I'll Thank you in person in a moment. But Matthew, was there anything else you, you wanted to, to highlight before we finish? No, I, I would just like to thank again our customers for taking the time, providing the insights around the challenges they're facing. I, I particularly got interested again on internal stakeholder communication. Um, we see that as a challenge across every operationalizing process um, we go through um, with customers when it comes to security ratings and very interested to continue that dialogue in terms of how we could potentially help make that process smoother. That's a huge aspect in terms of any program getting getting off the ground. So really exciting insights from everybody and thank you again. Great, thank you all. We'll be sending an email to follow up by early next week, uh, but for all of our delegates, we're really grateful for your time and we wish you in this year of the tiger uh, that uh, you have every success in measuring but also mitigating the cyber risk. Thanks very much. Goodbye.